Welcome to the preaching ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. Pastor Baker is fulfilling the call of God on his life to preach the truth of God's Word without compromise, raising up disciples who through faith in God will have a powerful impact on our world. May you be blessed and refreshed through the message that Pastor Baker has to share with you today. May God's very best be yours. back to Revelation 12. Yeah, praise the Lord. Revelation 12. Go to Revelation 12 tonight. We're going to pick back up on our part of our series on giving Satan no place where we left off last week. Uh, this should probably be the final part of this series. And then on Wednesday nights, we're just going to pick up on our faith series off of our Sunday morning uh, messages and keep going on our faith series. Revelation 12. Revelation 12, we've given you three very important things about what Scripture reveals as to how Satan comes to us. Why is it important uh, to know this? Because we don't want to give him any place in our life. The, the believer's been given authority over all the works of darkness, the ability to walk in victory over Satan and anything he tries to bring against us. But you and I need to understand how he works, what he does to try to get in our life, and how he wants to try to take advantage of us. If, it's like Jesus said, if you knew the thief was going to come, man, you'd be prepared. And when he showed up, you'd run him off, man. And if you and I are prepared, when he comes, guess what? We can run him off and we can walk in victory uh, as a child of God. Three ways Satan tries to get into our life. He comes subtly like a snake. As we see back in the Garden of Eden, it's even referred to again in the New Testament. And we've already talked about that, the subtle approaches of our current day society of media television, radio, all kinds of stuff, all kinds of influences that you just look everywhere that Satan's trying to use to subtly get into our life, to get us to constantly go through this reductionism of the Bible and say it really isn't that big a deal if I watch this, hear that, go here, go there. Uh, you, you, you're going to be crazy if you don't watch out for what Satan's using of the influences around you to try to get into your life. He's targeting your soul. He targets your soul. He does that by what you see, by what you hear, and by who you hang around. And I'll guarantee you who you're hanging around and what you watch and what you see and what you listen to is going to affect your soulish life, period. And, and if you allow that to get into your soul, uh, you allow that corruption to get in there, it's going to corrupt your walk with God. He's trying to circumvent your walk of faith. He's trying to keep you walking by sight, not by faith. He's trying to keep you focused on the natural, and he does that by infiltrating your soul. Because that's all the world lives by, is what they see in the natural. And you and I need to recognize why this so ties in with our series on uh, what is faith. Because this is what Satan's trying to rob you of. In Jesus' name, may he not do it. But if we know how he works, and we know what he tries to do to utilize stuff in our life, to get into our life, we can recognize it and get rid of it, praise God. He also comes not only subtly as a snake, he also comes as an angel of light. Second Corinthians talks about this. We've already discussed it. Uh, that refers to false ministers, false preachings, false teachings, and or a watered down message, lack of the word, not giving us the whole truth. I'm on a powerful new series in Granbury. I encourage you all to listen to those messages when you can stream them. You can get them off the website or through the iTunes or whatever about how to imitate God, how to imitate God. Uh, Ephesians 5 1 says we should do so. Amen. There's two keys to imitating God. You got to do what the Word says, and you got to be led by the Holy Spirit. I have found in my, all my years uh, as a pastor, 24 years, and longer than that, walking with Jesus Christ since 85, I, I, I have yet to meet a Christian who doesn't, who's ever told me intentionally that they do not want to imitate God. If I ever talk to him about wanting to walk with God, yeah, I'd love to, praise the Lord. But you know, I find that it's not wrong intentions that causes people to get off track. It's a lack of understanding of the Word or how to be led by the Holy Spirit. And if you don't know the Word, this is important. If you don't know the Word, I'm still on my second key of how He comes. He comes as an angel of light. If you've got a hunger for the things of God, but you don't know the Word, I'm going to tell you what. He can bring false doctrines to you that you'll start believing in, you'll start acting upon, you'll start thinking are true, and it doesn't even line up with Scripture. And you've you got to become a student of the Scriptures. You've got to learn how to study the Bible. I did kind of a mini uh, hermeneutics class down there Sunday night. And told them exactly what you got to know 
to understand how to, how to acknowledge the scriptures biblically. You've got to rightly divide the word of truth. I don't find Christians who I could say, do you want to walk in line with the word? Yeah. Uh, obviously, most of them do want to. So I don't find ones that say, nope, I don't want to walk in line with the word. Forget that Bible. Man, I, don't want, I mean, there's some nuts out there, but I had met them. Uh, not, not ones I've come across. So most people I find say, yeah, I want to walk in line with the word. Here's the problem. You got to know it and you got to know how to study it. You can't, because if you don't, you just take whatever any minister out here says and say it's, you know, obviously God be true because they're big and they're famous and they got a huge ministry and they're on television or whatever. The biggest problem we have today in the body of Christ with people that are hungry for God is that they're listening to too many voices. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. First Corinthians four, go study it out. Paul said the Corinthian church was the most immature church of all of the New Testament churches right. of all the works that church of uh, churches that Paul birthed. The Corinthian church was the most immature. And one of the reasons Paul tells them this is in first Corinthians four. He said, you have 10,000 instructors, his words. Now he's exaggerating. Right. But the point is, he's saying you're listening to every kind of preacher out here, but you have few fathers. Amen. It's amazing how many people will know and say, yeah, you're my shepherd, but they'll believe some other voice over what I say. Right. Now, we're not, trying to, we're not trying to argue or fight or compare here. The point is God gives you shepherds for, God gives you a shepherd and spiritual fathers for a reason. Right. Amen. I can see this going good, so I'm going to go a little farther. <laughs> How many of you chose your, chose your natural dad? Raise your hand if you chose your natural dad. Let me see your hand if you chose your natural dad. <laughs> None of you chose your natural dad. So why in the world do you think you'd choose your spiritual one? Everything of the natural is a type and shadow of the spiritual. Right. right? You didn't choose your natural dad. Like it or not, you didn't choose him. Amen? Amen. Like it or not, you shouldn't choose your spiritual one. Right. God should choose him. Right. But hey, the Corinthians were birthed by the Apostle Paul, and he was literally, and in my view, Scripturally, in the book of Acts and New Testament, the greatest preacher, in my opinion, that's ever probably walked the face of the planet. I don't believe there's never, in my opinion, I don't believe there has ever been a minister as powerful as the Apostle Paul. I can't find one. I can't find one in history more powerful than the Apostle Paul through what he went through. And, and, the life, and he just kept serving God and obedient, never stopped doing what God called him to do. I, I'm not putting down any of the other people, the Bible, or anybody else. I'm just telling you, in my opinion, I believe history will prove the Apostle Paul is the greatest. And you know what? Wouldn't it be exactly like what Scripture teaches? Because he who thinks he's greatest is least, but he who thinks he's least is really greatest. And what did the Apostle Paul say about himself all the time? I'm the least of the apostles. I'm the least to be called an apostle. Amen? So he didn't brag on himself. I'm bragging on Paul. Here was the greatest apostle that ever lived, and the church he birthed in Corinth, they would not even listen to Paul anymore. Right. There were people that were constantly telling the church in Corinth, this Paul's a nut, you shouldn't listen to him, he's off the deep end, and they started listening to these other people and stopped listening to the very guy that birthed them in Christ and brought them salvation to begin with. And then sent Timothy to him and Titus to him and others. So I'm, I'm on point number two still. I'm just trying to help you understand that if you want to keep Satan out of your life, you don't need 10,000 instructors. Because right. Satan also comes as an angel of light. Angel of light. I like what Paul told Timothy about this subject. Paul told Timothy, Timothy he said, son, he said, you better stick to the things you've learned and you better know who you learned them from. Amen. Quote, unquote. You better know who you learned them from. Now, I'm not putting down preachers on television. My pastor, Dr. Barclay, is on television. I'm not doing any of that. I'm saying there comes a point as a believer that if you want to mature and you're going to listen to every other voice out here, how do you know if what they're saying is true or not? Amen. Unless you're a really good student of the Bible, initially, how are you going to know if they're true or not? Right. Well, how do we know if you're true? I tell you all the time, don't believe anything because I told you. Right. That's right. Become a student of the Bible and back it up with the Word of God. Make sure the Bible says it. But see, I have another question for you about this because the Holy Spirit won't let me off of this. How many of you know that what most people do when they go to find a church and they know to obviously listen to the preaching? You know what they do when they go to find a church if they're already born again? They're going to go find a church where they agree with everything the pastor says. You're never going to find the right church God wants you in. 
Because what you just said is, is that you are already fully mature as a believer and you have no more maturity. You have no more maturing to do. Ladies and gentlemen, my pastor, Dr. Barclay, has preached and still does on occasion preach stuff that initially when I hear it, I don't totally agree with it. Right. Amen. Does that astound you? No. no. You know why I don't? I'm not at the level he's at yet. That's right. He's walked with God a little longer than I have, and he's still growing. That's right. And it's been amazing how many times, you know, down the road, just meditating and praying about that and looking at that, and I go, wow, now I see what he's saying. He was really right about that. Praise the <laughs> I, don't, I don't call my pastor and say, hey, Pastor Barclay, I don't agree with what you just preached here. I'm a little smarter than that. <laughs> but for anybody to say, I'm going to find a church that preaches everything I believe, well, number one, there ain't, no, there ain't one preacher in all the world on all the planet that's 100% correct in their doctrine. But number two, they ought to be trying to stay away from stuff, obviously, that's not true. That's just to tickle people's itching ears. Right. But to ever say, I'm going to find a church based on whether they teach everything I want, you can't find that in the Scriptures. You can't find one verse that says, Here's your, how do you know you're a pastor or your church? You go find a church that you agree everything they teach in. No. no, that witness has to bear witness with your heart that I found my shepherd book of John chapter 10. Hallelujah. And don't think therefore you're going to agree with everything I, I teach or everything I say. Praise the Lord because guess what? Uh, all of us are still growing, including me hopefully in Jesus' name. Amen. Right? Amen. I say hopefully. I mean I know I am, but I'm just telling you I wouldn't want a pastor that doesn't keep growing. So what are we still talking about? The second way he comes. Today it's a big deal. And that's why I'm spending a little extra time on this one, although we've already taught on it. But he comes as an angel of light. Comes as an angel of light. I personally would not be wanting to receive the ministry of somebody who's not called to be a pastor who's claiming to be a pastor. That's right. Right. I can name names, but I will not. But there's many ministers today who are on television and are very famous who claim to be pastors, and, they, and God has not gifted them to be pastors. Amen. So you're going to receive their ministry when God did not even gift them to be in that calling? But you know how many Christians do? Amen. Don't shout me down just because I'm preaching good. Can you say Amen. amen. So my whole point is, he comes as an angel of light. For you, that might not be some deceptive teaching to mislead you, but you know what? It might get you in a position where all of a sudden you get to listen to stuff that might not be the whole truth, and then you come here and you hear the whole truth, and now you start que questioning the truth. Amen. Thank you for all your amens tonight. Amen. Uh, I'll quote John 8, 31 and 32 to see if I can get off this subject, if the Holy Spirit will let me go. <laughs> if you abide... You believer, if you live in my word, right. you're my disciple indeed. We're all supposed to grow to be up to, grow up to be disciples. Amen. If you live in my word, you're my disciple indeed. Now, everybody loves verse 32. What's verse 32? And you shall know the truth. The truth will set you free. Now, if you're not living in the word as a student and know what it says. Right. If you hear false teaching, do you know the truth? No. Nope. And it won't bring any liberty to you. If you hear watered down preaching, is it the whole truth? Nope, and it won't bring any liberty to you. See, this is why we got to live in the Word. Because if you abide in the Word, become a student of the Bible, you're not going to fall prey to this deceptive work of Satan who comes as an angel of light. Don't think he doesn't approach us, all of us, as an angel, all three ways. I promise you he does. I promise you he does. What's the third way he comes? It was found in 1 Peter 5. He comes as a roaring lion. He's a big mouth. Tell somebody he's got a big mouth. But tell him he's got no teeth. <laughs> yeah, man. It's kind of like the abominable snowman, you know. It's like the guy that plucked all the abominable snowman's teeth, you know, out, the little guy. Jesus has plucked all his teeth out. Right? He's all roar, but that's all he is. He's just all roar. Now, there's multiple ways, and I want to talk, touch on this real quick, and then we'll look at our verses. There's multiple ways he comes as a roaring lion. All right. One, he comes, as we're reading in these verses, as the accuser of the brethren. He will try through his best ability by voicing stuff to your brain, throwing thoughts into your brain, etc. He will try to convince you to look back to the old person. You don't deserve to be blessed. God ain't going to bless you. Not the way you've lived. You don't deserve to be healed. You don't deserve to be married. You don't deserve to have a spouse. You don't deserve to have the one you have. And on and on and on he could go. 
what, what's amazing about Satan, in a sense, that you got to know about him, but also when you understand him, it helps you point him out a little bit better, is it's not like he doesn't say anything that's true. He just can't ever say a complete truth. Because right. 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 he's the father of lies. But even liars learn how to use partial truth. It's the best, best way to deceive people. You don't just tell them a total lie. You got to use a little truth in there. Right? It's like rat poison. Rat poison is 99.9% .9 good food. Go look on the label. It's 0.1% poison. It's the 0.1% poison that gets you every time. Or the rat, I should say. Right, Joshua? So, so recognize the importance of this, what I'm saying. What Satan will do is he will try to use some truth. You don't deserve. Well, guess what? That's true. None of us deserve anything. We did nothing to deserve anything God's done for us. So he starts off with a partial truth. But then he uses that partial truth and adds a lie to it. Therefore, God won't heal you. Well, he won't heal me because I deserve it. He won't heal me because I did anything to deserve it. He'll heal me because Jesus did something for me to deserve it. You're not going to get healed because you deserved it. You're not going to get blessed because you deserved it. Right? You're not going to get what God has for your life because you deserved it because none of us did anything to deserve what God's given us. That's called grace. Amen. Grace means I got what I didn't deserve. So this roaring lion will try to convince you by getting you to focus on your past. Look at the old nature. Look at the old man. Oh, you don't deserve none of this stuff. But see, you got to recognize to stop looking at the old outer fleshly man. You got to recognize who's doing this. Amen. And you got to start knowing who I am on the inside and what the blood of Jesus did to change me on the inside. Amen. To make me brand new on the inside. Amen. Right? Revelation 12, 9. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth. His angels were cast out with him. Verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. We've taught on that before. But that's what's available to every one of us believers. Through these three things we're talking about, blood of the Lamb, word of our testimony, not loving our lives to death, we activate salvation, strength, the kingdom of our God, and the power of our Christ. Amen. And in doing so, we do. this was all given to us, what for? For the accuser. For what? The accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Verse 11, and they, who's the they? Those who have received salvation, they overcame him. So how do we overcome him? Because God looks at everything that's already done. They overcame him by three things, the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. When you start beating yourself up, feel depressed, get down, get upset, get whatever. I'll tell you, I'll tell you who just got a position of infiltrating your thought life. Satan did. And you're not acknowledging what the blood of Jesus did to deliver you from this stinking liar. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? Because anytime we get to a point where we're getting down on ourselves, be beating ourselves up, feeling depressed, whatever, or just feeling like a nothing or a zero instead of a hero, you know, that's nothing but Satan trying to fill, infiltrate your mind, your soul. He's after your soul. And he's simply allowed somehow he, his voice has overshadowed uh, the presence of God. The roaring lion, that voice has become stronger in your thoughts than what the Bible says about you and who's living on the inside. And that's why you got to know very clearly what the blood of the lamb did for you. To deal with this from the perspective of three things we were just given, we're going to touch on the first one. We already taught on it last week, and then I'm going to finish the last two tonight. One, you got to know about the blood of the lamb. What do you mean? Two things. You need to know what that blood did when it redeemed you. And the foundation of what you got to know is your right standing with God. That blood gave you right standing with God. You've been justified by his blood. Justified means you've been declared right with God. Who declared you right with God? God did. Amen. Who declared you right with God? God did. Who declared you right with God? Jesus did. Right. What voiced that truth on this earth? His blood voiced that truth. If Abel's blood speaks, I will promise you Jesus' blood speaks. Amen. And that blood speaks of four things that prove to you and to the whole world I'm right with God. 
And it has nothing to do with what you can do. It has nothing to do with what you've accomplished or haven't accomplished. And you've got to learn those four things because those four things are the foundations. They're the legs of what righteousness is built on. How do I know I have right standing with God? One, because of justification. Justification means I'm already accepted by God. I don't have to prove myself to him. I don't have to do anything in the way of works to, uh, to get to a point of feeling good about myself. I'm already accepted by God. And therefore, obviously, my value and worth should now once again come from him. Amen. Two, reconciliation. Reconciliation means what? It means that I'm now approved by God. I've been restored back into an intimate relationship with him. I don't need anybody's approval. I don't need anybody's approval. Single people ought to learn this one above everything else. Because if you think you need somebody else to complete you or make you happy, you haven't learned about reconciliation yet. God's already approved of you. you got an intimate relationship with God. I'll tell you what, you don't need somebody else to make you feel good about yourself. Amen. If, that's the, if, you're, if you believe that, you've fallen for this lie. And Satan can take advantage of your life. Tell, him I'm, tell somebody, I'm giving him no place in my life. <laughs> the third thing righteousness is built on, propitiation. Propitiation means Jesus Christ of Nazareth bore your punishment. Yes. Bore your punishment. So when you, if, if, if you listen, if and when you do sin in this life, and hopefully not willingly, guess what? God is not punishing you. He's not even punishing sinners right now. Because right. Jesus bore that punishment at Calvary. His wrath will not be seen until the latter part of the tribulation period. And then the ultimate wrath of God won't be seen until, obviously, uh, the great white throne judgment. Amen. So recognize God's not punishing us. I've already given you. We've taught on these things many times. I just finished this whole series again back in Granbury about how to reign in life and these four truths to redemption. But you've got to know them as a believer, right. which I'll get to the second point here, why it's so important you know these. And then the fourth thing is what? Re uh, regeneration. Regeneration means I'm a new creation in Christ. The lie of Satan is can't change. It's just the way you are. It's the way you've always been. That's a lie. You're a new creation on the inside. Guess what? Old things can now pass away. All, 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 all things can become new. Amen. So you've fallen for a lie if you've allowed Satan to convince you that you got something about your life can't change. That's a lie. Do you know, how, you know how quick Satan comes to steal what I'm preaching right now? Right now. Amen. You know how many people, it's broken my heart in services before where I've actually seen people uh, upset, hurt, or get offended and leave because you're preaching the word? So you got to recognize this is Satan doing this. That's right. This is the work of Satan doing this. This is Satan trying to rob me from what God wants. Why don't you get indignant against Satan? Come on. Why don't you rise up and get indignant against the one that's trying to steal, kill, and destroy from you and say, I am not allowing you advantage in my life. You're not taking advantage of me. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? But if you don't know he's infiltrating like this roaring lion, how do you know he's coming in as a roaring lion? Because your thoughts and now your feelings that go contrary to the word of God are speaking louder to you than what God's word says. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? You better counter it. You better counter it quick. You better go after it with the Word of God. How? Because you got to know, first of all, what? What the blood of Jesus did to redeem my life. So you got to know what the Word of God says. Two, there's another side to the blood of the Lamb that we got to walk out to recognize we don't give Satan place to our life. And that is living in willful sin. Right. And we read that out of Hebrews where it literally tells us that if you continue to live in willful sin... A decision which you could walk away from any time. You know you're not doing what you should do. You know you're living wrong, but you choose to do it anyway. You don't care, in other words. I don't care. If you live that kind of an attitude about sin as a believer, the Bible says you're treating the blood of Jesus as a common, ordinary, everyday thing. And you're trampling it underfoot. And that's not a good thing to do. Satan will definitely take advantage of your life doing so. Amen. So obviously one of the things we should do also in acknowledgement of the blood of Jesus is we should not treat that blood as a common ordinary thing. Right. And the way you do that is you walk in reverence towards God. Amen. You say, I do want to live a life set apart to Him. I do want to live a life free from sin. Big part of why He came and died and, and paid the price for me. Shout amen. amen. So the blood of the Lamb redeemed our life and gave us the ability to have victory over every aspect of life, including sin. So you can't, you, you can't go out and live in willful sin and act like it's no big deal and say Satan's not going to take advantage of me. Yes, he will. Yes, 
Yes, He will. And again, see, if you go live in willful, blatant sin, God's not punishing you. Bad things start happening. That's the result of sin. You sow to the flesh, you reap corruption. Sow to the Spirit, you reap life. Say, I'm reaping life in Jesus' name. All right, move on to point number two now that we need to pick up on. So that's the significance of the blood of the Lamb, how we overcome this roaring lion. But now you got to tie with the blood of the Lamb these other two things. They all three go together. They're not separate. If you don't know what the blood of the Lamb did for you, it won't help you. Uh, number, you, won't, you won't even go to number two, the word of your testimony. If I don't know what the blood of Jesus did for me, I certainly ain't, no, ain't going to know what to say when Satan comes. In Ephesians 6, the Bible says that the offensive weapon you have against this enemy of yours is called the sword of the Spirit, which the Bible calls the Word of God. It, it does you no good to keep it in its sheath. It does you no good. A sword in its sheath is going to have somebody that's going to be defeated as a soldier. The purpose of that sword is to pull it out, wield it at your enemy, and go at him and tear him up with it. And that's called the Word of God coming out your mouth. But see, back to point one, you got to know based on what the blood of Jesus did for me, you got to know what you have a right to as a child of God. You got to know you got a right to healing, not because of what you did, because of what he did. Amen. You got to know you've got a right to live in peace in this life. You got to know you got a right to walk in the joy of the Lord. You got to know you got a right to walk in the love of God. Right. Right. Come on, church. You got to know you got a right to heaven. Amen. You got a future home. You got to know you got a right to these things. Because Satan's going to challenge you like a roaring lion. These stinking fiery darts of this loud mouth being are going to come at you and try to convince you otherwise. But see, if you know number one, if you know what the blood of the Lamb did for you and who you are in Christ, then, you, then now you go to number two. Get your sword out. Do not treat Satan with silence. Amen. You don't counter Satan with silence. You counter Satan with the Word of God. Right. Even if you're being tempted to sin. Amen. You want to know why most Christians give in to sin? They know when the temptation comes. They say nothing. They say nothing. They might even think something of obviously what the Word says, but they say nothing. Perfect example. Jesus being tempted for 40 days in the, in the wilderness. Every time Satan tempted Jesus, what did Jesus do? It is Written, And here come a verse of Scripture. Now, if the Son of God did that, Amen. if that's what the Son of God did to overcome Satan, do you think you're going to overcome Satan by not getting the Word of God on your mouth? You've got to get the Word of God on your mouth. Ladies and gentlemen, when all of a sudden the behavior of your kids gets a little weird, a little whacked out, or your relationship with your spouse ain't going good, or things at work, or things are... Listen, you shouldn't be going after flesh and blood. That's not your enemy. You should be going after the true enemy, the work of Satan, who's obviously at work in some way at times to try to ransack our life. You ought to be getting the Word of God on your mouth. Hallelujah. Can you say Amen. Mo Let me back up. Let me back up. I almost said most. I'm going to say pretty much all. A little more than most in my opinion. Pretty much all Christians get defeated because they do not use their sword. Good word, Pastor. I'll guarantee you, if you stop and think about every defeat you've had in your life, if you go back and think about that defeat, number one, how much of the word did you know how to counter that very issue? Number two, how much of the word were you speaking to counter it? You'll find out you either didn't know what the Word said about it, my people perish for a lack of knowledge, or number two, you weren't using the Word, you weren't, you weren't putting it on your mouth. Amen. Don't whack him with the sword once. Cut him up, man. <laughs> he shows up tomorrow, pull it back out. Amen. If I got a gun at home and a thief comes in the door and I pull that gun and stick it in his face, I'm going to tell him you got two choices, buddy. Let me tell you to him real quick. One, turn around and get the heck out of my home. Two, choose not to. I'll pull the trigger. Decide right now. Amen. End of story. You didn't move? Sorry, that's why I shot you. That's right. But Christians want to play around with Satan. I don't mean intentionally, but all of a sudden these thoughts come. you got to treat him the same way. you got to use what, what the military calls a show of force. We're talking about giving Satan no place in our life. When he comes as a roaring lion, you, you better get your mouth open and you better not be cussing and you better not be saying a bunch of worldly stuff. You better be yielding your sword at him. Amen. 
I'm going to tell you something, church. And by the Holy Spirit, God is dealing with me on this right now. And he's telling me, this church family of yours, many are being defeated in their life because these thoughts come and they say nothing. Amen. When the thoughts come, declare the word of the Lord. Amen. Say what the Bible says. Amen. Well, I'm feeling depressed. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Just keep feeling depressed? No. I'm a child of God. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I've been washed in the blood. I have been delivered from all the powers of darkness, and that includes depression. Amen. Amen. Nehemiah 8.10, I have the joy of the Lord. It is my strength. That's right. I've got the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, depression, you get out of here. It's just like, listen, see it, just like that thief walking in the door. Pull the gun. You got two choices, buddy. Right. Turn and run or I start firing. Amen. Good don't stand and wait for them to have a, don't let them now have a conversation with you. Well, I'll leave in just a minute. Boom. Sorry. Wrong choice. <laughs> I'm using that as an analogy against Satan. Right. You got two choices. Get out of here or I'm pulling my sword. He don't run. Pull your sword. Immediately start firing scripture off. Right. I'm talking about giving Satan no place in your life. And a lot of Christians don't realize that they're being defeated by the enemy because he's after your soul. Right. And one of the way he comes is like a roaring lion. You must know what the Bible says. Hey, here's what's great. You don't have to, you don't have to quote chapter and verse. Right. Right. Satan doesn't respond to chapter and verse. But if you know that truth in your heart and can speak it with your mouth, he knows whether you know it or not. That's right. Can you say amen? amen? And as long as you know what that Bible says about you. And then, because see, he'll stand there and try to mess with you. Well, let's talk about your past. I ain't talking about my past. It's over. That's right. Let's talk about your future and what's about to happen to you right now. Amen. Can I get a better amen? You should write yourself a note. I need to use my sword more. I need to use my sword more. Christians don't use it enough. We allow these thoughts for far too long to infiltrate our thinking. That's the roaring lion. Well, I just thought they were my thoughts. You're a child of God. You think you're going to have thoughts that are contrary to what God says about you? These are called fiery darts. Fiery darts. You know, it's no different. I like, you know, it's like uh, Pastor Barclay gives Mrs. B's testimony about when she first found out and was told she had cancer. Right. And said, most women die from this form of cancer. When they got out to the car, Pastor, first thing he said was, I want to know right now what your number one fear is. Because those, those words are faith robbers. I want to know right now what your number one fear is. What's your, what is your number one fear, worst case scenario, that I would die and I wouldn't be here anymore? He says, well, if that's your worst fear, we got this thing beat. Because let's say worst case scenario happened. If that's your worst fear and you die, you're going to heaven. Amen. You're going to the place we dreamed about. You're going to the place we've longed for. Amen. Now, see, people think that's crazy to talk that way. No, it ain't. Satan wants to get you in fear. You start thinking about heaven, you're not going to be afraid. You certainly ain't going to be afraid to go there. Now you start to turn the tables. What's your second fear? That I would live, but this thing would so debilitate me that I could not be a helpmate to you to help you fulfill your ministry as well as be with my family. He said, well, let's deal with that right now. And then he pulled out scripture that he stood on, spoke to her. They immediately dealt with that fear. So you got to have a show of force the minute this stuff starts trying to come to you. Don't play around with it for even 24 hours or even an hour. Or I wouldn't even give it five minutes. Like a better amen. Amen. Because this is one of the ways that Satan takes advantage. A roaring lion. And it just means that voice is getting louder in your head than what the Bible says. Yes. Turn it around. Get the sword of the Spirit out. Go with me to uh, Ephesians chapter 4. Amen. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4. Amen. Say, praise the, Lord. praise the Lord. Ephesians chapter 4. Now, I quoted it <clears throat> before uh, Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. 
of the tongue. Well, what about these bad thoughts anyway, Pastor? Are they going to affect my life? Not unless you start speaking them. A thought given no voice to dies unborn. A thought given no voice to dies unborn. But you better start speaking to it or it's going to start coming out your mouth if you don't get rid of it. Right. I'm going to say it again. A thought not spoken dies unborn. How do things come into existence? Your words. Your words. And Ephesians 4 warns us about this. We looked at this verse already before. Look again in verse 27, and we'll see this in context to what uh, we're actually talking about. Nor give what? Nor give place to the devil. Let him obviously who stole do what? You should still no longer. Wouldn't that be giving place to the devil? Yeah. Rather let him what? Labor working with his hands what is good that he may have something to do what? To give to him who has what? You know why you should be working? To have something to give. If, you, if you're living out Matthew 6, you're not working for a living. You're working for a giving. 29. This is right in the same context. We're to give the devil no place, correct? Watch this. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. See, if those thoughts come, but you don't speak them, they die unborn. Right. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification or building you up, that it may impart grace. What do we want to impart? Grace to who? Now, most people read this verse and they only see it from one perspective. They think that what Paul is primarily saying is that we should not be speaking corrupt words to one another. Granted, included. But guess who hears you more than anybody else? You do. Or excuse me. Guess who you hear more than anybody else? You hear you. This applies to you. This applies to you talking to yourself. If you're speaking corrupt words... What are corrupt words? Words of the enemy that are going to continue to corrode and corrupt your soul and corrode and corrupt your belief system and corrode and corrupt your faith. Amen. And therefore corrode and corrupt your life. And that's the problem is it's a process and we don't always pick up on that. Right. Sound like just the minute I spoke a word that's coming to pass. But you got to be careful and guard. Here's my point about this, about watching what you say. Excuse me, about uh, uh, the word of your testimony. Remember, the word of my testimony won't cause you victory. Right. The word of my testimony cannot bring you victory. Right. It's the word of your testimony. Remember what it said in Revelation 12, 10? And by the word of your testimony. You overcome by the word of your testimony. Amen. Amen. So it's not, my, it's not what I say about you. It's just like having everybody else pray for you. But what are you saying? Right. Amen. I got everybody praying in faith, but I'm saying, boy, I just don't know. I don't know if I'm going to get healed this time. I don't know if God's going to come through. Your testimony is denouncing everybody else's prayers. Right. A lot of people do this. You ever prayed for somebody and heard them talking five minutes later? Yeah. Yeah. And if, if you know the word, you know, well, that prayer I prayed ain't doing much good. Ladies and gentlemen, you got to watch your words. Yes. I could go to James and I could preach for the next six weeks or six months on your words. Amen. You got to let how many corrupt words come out? No. None. Let no corrupt word, no corrupt word proceed out of what? Proceed out of what? Tell somebody that include that little thing right here on you right here. Tell them that include this thing right here on you. See, don't let any, any corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart what? What's it going to impart? Grace. What's it going to impart? Grace. It's going to impart more of heaven's help in our life. Yes. Are the words I'm speaking helping me based on what the word says? Or are they hurting me? Are they going contrary to what the word of God says? Or are they helping me? I'm going to tell you something else about faith. Because again, this goes right along with our faith series. Great men and women of faith, you will find, are people of very few words. Very few. 
Every single minister I've ever heard talk about Kenneth Hagin, ever, said if you ever got around Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Hagin rarely said anything, ever. You had to get him to say something. You had to work on him to get a conversation going. Now, if you started talking about the Bible to a preacher, you're going to get a sermon. You're going to get him talking. But very few words come out of great men and women of faith. Do you know why? Go to Luke 6 and I'll let the Bible tell you. Luke 6. Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're not just supposed to use the word of God in vain. Right? Right? We're supposed to use it for its intended purpose. Building us up. Sword of the spirit. Tearing the enemy down. Luke chapter 6. What words they do speak, if they do, are going to be biblical. Line up with the word of God. And that's what you're going to hear consistently. Other than that, you're not going to hear much out of them. Luke chapter 6, verse 45. A good man... Out of the good treasure of his heart, he brings forth what? What does he bring forth? Good. Good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth what? Evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth, men and women of faith fill their, their hearts with the word of God. What's in their heart in abundance is the word. Well, why don't they speak very much, Pastor? Because most people really don't want to start conversations about the Word of God. Amen. They want to talk about everything else but the Word of God. And that's why they don't say much, because they're full of the Word of God. Amen. How the abundance of the heart, the... Wow. So what's in there is what comes out. Amen. If you're talking about a subject, and I don't focus a lot of my time and attention on worldly stuff, and it's worldly... I'm not going to say much because I don't have much of that in my heart to talk about. If I've got more of the word in my heart and you're talking about a subject that doesn't obviously coincide with the word, how would I have anything to say about that subject? Great men and women of faith are people of of few words because they said most people would get around them would want to talk about something other than that which was biblical. And those aren't those words aren't in their heart. So they got nothing to say about it. I hope you got the point. If it's not in there, it ain't coming out. What's in there in abundance? Now, there's another good thing to this. What if I spout off once in a while say a little something I shouldn't say? It's not, a, it's not an issue if you said something wrong once in a while. It's what are you saying consistently? Right? And, and we just recognize watching our words. But here's the problem. If you don't watch what you're listening to, it don't matter how much you try to change your words. They're not going to change. Right. To watch your words, you got to watch what you're feeding on. What are you taking in? Because what's going in is what's coming out consistently. Hey, God's been dealing with me on this for the past six months of my life. He's been making me listen to my conversation, my words more than ever. Because he knows I'm on this pursuit of greater faith. I'm on this pursuit of going to a higher level. I'm on this pursuit of getting closer to God. I'm on this pursuit of getting even farther away from the things of this world and things of this life. I'm not talking about pulling away from people. I'm just talking about the stuff of the world. And and God, if you really want to do that kind of stuff, God's going to start showing you. Here's what it's going to take to get there. And one of the things he started doing with me, he started showing me, listen to all the stuff you talk about. Listen to your own words. Let's know what comes out of your mouth. I'm not, Kathy, tell you, I don't run around and cuss and do all that kind of stuff. But all of a sudden it began to make me realize how much words are coming out of my mouth about topics that it's not necessarily wrong to know any. No, no, I'm not telling you you can't know anything else about anything else. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is, what do you want in the abundance of your heart? What do you want in there? Do you want the abundance of the word or do you want the abundance of the world? Because you're going to have one or the other. If you got the abundance of the word, guess what's coming out of your mouth? The word of God's coming out of your mouth. Guess what's more likely to be used when the enemy comes against you? Coming out of your mouth, the sword of the spirit. Amen. But if we don't have abundance of the word going in, it's not going to come out. It's the treasure in us. It's what we're treasuring in us that's coming out. And guess what great men and women of faith have? They have a great treasure of the Word of God in their heart. I told you, and I, man, this, this Lester Summerall series has been an eye-opener to me. 
big time about what faith really is. Right. And I see what he's saying. People who say they want the faith of a Lester Summerall or a John G. Lake, when you find out what that really is, you'll find out a lot of Christians say, well, <laughs> I don't know. I'm kind of happy the way I am. I don't want to lack any faith. I want to keep, I want my faith to keep growing, keep growing, keep growing, keep growing, keep growing, keep growing. Hallelujah. That's my desire. That's what I want. It's like these bodybuilders, man. I mean, when my faith pops out, I want you to see it pop out of every single ripple of my body. Man. Amen. Amen. I don't want to be in a position where God needs to use me and I don't have the faith to step up to the plate and let God use me. I don't want that to happen. I don't want to be somewhere where somebody may need to be raised from the dead or a demon cast out of them or a sickness healed from their body or something major that would totally change their life. Obviously, especially if there's somebody needs to be raised. I don't want to lack the faith. I don't want to lack the trust in my God to know that God, if need be, and he needs me, can use me. Goes far beyond me. I'm not trying to build faith to get me more stuff. I'm, 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 be, I'm already beyond that one. I'm not exercising my faith to get things anymore. I'm exercising my faith to see miracles, signs, and wonders. I'm telling you, my faith has been exercised for years. God, I, you, there's things you got to learn what you're passionate about that God gave you a passion for. That burns within you. It burns within me to, to, to want to help ministers. It burns within me to want to teach them the things that I've been blessed with and I've been taught through experiences, the Bible, and now especially my pastor who is a great minister to ministers. Amen. God just opened us a door to Uganda. Right. I am going to start doing monthly streaming teachings to pastors in Uganda. To teach them how to study the Bible, to teach them about Bible governments, to teach them about raising up leadership, to teach them about how to make disciples for Jesus Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, our church just got expanded to reaching thousands of people. Amen. Far beyond what I ever pictured in my mind reaching. Because for every one of those pastors we help, guess how many people we just helped through those pastors? You don't know the joy in my heart that I have to be able to do this kind of stuff. Because it's a major part of what burns within my heart. But you know what? God's been having to prepare me to get the faith for that. Amen. To know I'm capable of doing that. You know how many times Satan's tried to convince me? Oh, man, who do you think you are to teach other ministers? Who do you think you are? Look at the size of your church. Look at this. This is what he does to me. He comes to everybody, ladies and gentlemen. I don't care who you are. But I'll tell you what. He did the same thing with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul did not have a big following. People bailed on him all the time. He was alone a lot of the time. Can you say amen? And I'm just telling you, you've got to have abundance of the word. You've got to watch your, you got to watch your words. How do you watch your words? What are you taking in? And, and listen, you can't just say, here's a key. Here's a key. Turn with me to Colossians 3. Go to Colossians. No, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold your place right there in Luke 6. Let me show you one thing before we leave there. Go ahead. And you can turn to Colossians 3 and get a finger in there because we're going to jump over there. But I'm going to show you. Don't lose Luke 6 yet. Here's a key. Here's something you got to recognize. All right. Is it important to guard and keep out of my heart what I don't want to have going in there? Yes. But it's not. That's not enough. That's not enough. You got to put in there what you want in there. You can't just cut off what you know you need to keep out. You got to put in what you know you need to put in. That takes more time in the Word. Because I see when I was a young minister and a young Christian how hungry I was for the Word of God. You couldn't get in my truck, uh, my pickup. You couldn't get in my, my uh, 18-wheeler, uh, dump my... Uh, a uh, rock hauling truck that without, there was, there was tapes playing of the word teaching all the time. And it's amazing how I watched Satan drift me away from that. Now I'm back to that again. Right. Now I'm back to that. I actually love the drive from here to Granbury. Because I hear the word of God hours at a time on Sunday going back and forth to Granbury. Right. 
I love, I love these extra drive times because now I just plug in my, my uh, phone with my player man and, and put on a teaching of my pastor, Dr. Sumrall, and I just listen to the word, feed on the word, feed on the word, feed on the word, feed on the word. Out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth is going to speak. Amen. It's not important you just keep out what you got to keep out. You got to put in there what needs to go in there. If you want to watch your words, you're going to have to change. I'm sorry. You're going to have to change how you live. Amen. You have to change what you listen to in your car. You have to change what you listen to in your home. You have to change what you do sometimes at home in the evening. And instead of playing on Facebook or watching television, you're going to have to turn it off and pick your Bible up and read your Bible once in a while. If you want to give Satan no place, because out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth is going to speak. Can you say amen? amen. All right. Uh, the last point. So the blood of the lamb, this is how we overcome him, the roaring lion. Blood of the lamb, word of our testimony. Remember the last point? We're not going to love our lives to the death. The to the death, yeah. If, if Jesus tarries and, and I live my life out to the day that I physically uh, stop existing as a physical body and leave this body, leave this planet up until that day is what it's talking about. I'm not supposed to love my life. Not supposed to live for me. Amen. This, will, this will help me to give Satan no place. Hey, a simple question. If you're living for you, do you think Satan can take advantage of you? But what if you're living for God every day? What if your focus is the Lord? What if you're living for the Lord every day? How, how much harder is it going to be for Satan to take advantage of your life if you're living for the Lord every day? Amen. That's what Luke goes on to tell us. 46, Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord? And do not do those things that I say. Whoever comes to me, hears my sayings and what? Does them. I will show you whom he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and he laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood arose, notice it did come. Yeah. The storm, the roaring lion. Yeah. Floods are, a flood, I mean, we're talking about like hurricane force winds. You know what I'm saying? Tornadoes in Texas, whatever kind of thing. We're not just talking about rising of water here. Read on. The flood arose. The stream beat vehemently against that house. It's a loud, it's a loud storm. It's a roaring lion. Amen. But guess what? Couldn't shake the house. woo -hoo! Couldn't shake the house. Little George Evans for you there. woo -hoo! Come on, man. Couldn't shake the house. Amen. Why? It was founded on the rock. Who are the Christians that are being shaken in the midst of the storms of life, the roaring lion? Those who are hearing the word, but they're not doing it. If you're not doing what the Bible says, Jesus is not the ultimate Lord right. over your life. Why do you call me Lord, but you're not doing what I tell you? Tell somebody, keep uh, Jesus on the throne of your life. Tell them. Turn back to him and say, keep yourself off of that throne of yours. 49, he who heard the word, but did nothing with it. Right. It's like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation. No foundation against which the stream also beat vehemently. Storms come to you whether you're born again or not. Storms come to you whether you live out the word or not. Amen. But immediately that house fell and the ruin of that house was what? It was great. What causes a person to not do what the Lord's saying? You're not looking at him. You're looking at you. I know the Bible says that, Pastor, but what happened to Jesus being the Lord? Right. I'd like to make my marriage work, and I know that's what I'm supposed to do, but. You know how many times I've sat in my office with people like Kevin and others and, and Joshua and stuff, and I tell them what the Bible says. Yeah, Pastor, but come on. Wait a minute, wait a minute man. Are you going to be the Lord, or is Jesus going to be the Lord? Amen. God knows how to make this work. He knows how to get it fixed. Well, we come and we've asked pastor about problems with the kids and what we should do. And I tell him what the Bible says. Well, I know that, but no, no, no. Just do what the Bible says. Amen. Don't understand why my money's not working for me. Why God ain't blessing me. You tithe or no. Well, there's your, there's your number one problem right there. Amen. Well, I don't believe in that tithing stuff. Then be your own Lord. Right. Be the Lord over your money. Right. Amen. They didn't say that. No, 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 no. <laughs> Kathy always thinks of everybody. She's always worried about me offending and hurting everybody. It's a loving, uh, loving uh, first lady of the house. They didn't say those things. 
They didn't say, they didn't say, you know, oh, we got to tithe. I ain't going to tithe. I've gone way beyond them. I'm just going, I've just got to other, I'm going to talk about other people. So, yeah, I understand people can misunderstand what I say. No, they didn't ask those questions. I got off the married part a long time ago. I moved on. Move on with me. Come on. Amen. All I'm saying is whatever the Bible says, you can have your excuse, but it doesn't change the Bible and the Bible works. The word of God, the Bible says is proven. God's way is perfect. There ain't no better way. You ain't going to figure out a better way than God's way. There ain't one. Right now go to Colossians three. We'll close here. Praise the Lord. You all should be grateful for a wonderful first lady because she's always thinking about you guys and me. Me saying stuff that would make it sound like I'm putting you down or running you down. Which I'm not doing, but I understand why it could be interpreted that way if it's misunderstood. Colossians 3, verse 1. So how do we, how do we not love our lives to the death, Pastor? How do I become a doer of the word? I'm glad you asked. I'm, Paul's going to show us right here in Colossians 3. If then you were raised with Christ, if you were raised with Christ, if you were raised with Christ, see, I'm not loving my life to the death. Well, if you were raised with Christ, then evidently that old, something happened to that old life. Why are you trying to hold on to that old life? If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are where? Above, where God, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your mind. Amen. Set your mind. Those are the three most important words in these three verses. Set your mind. Where? On things above. On the Lord above. Not on things on the earth. Three. Underline the next three words, please. For you died. Amen. You want to love not your life to the death? I'm going to give you the, here it is. You ready for this? Here's the, here's the best phrase you can remind yourself of. To love not my life to the death and keep Jesus as the Lord of my life. Live like a dead man. Because you are one. Amen. Live like a dead man. Dead to the old nature. It's dead. It died. He just said it. I didn't say it. Don't look at me bad. We're not talking about the end of a physical life here. We're talking about the, the death of the old sinful nature on the inside, the old spirit man. For you died and your life is what? It is now hidden with Christ in God. You want to know one of the best things you can do in your life to keep Satan out as a roaring lion? Live like a dead man. When all of a sudden some, something starts offending you, dead people don't get offended. I've never gone to a funeral and ever, ever, never, ever saw anybody who had died at a funeral depressed. Right. Not the one that died. Right. Amen. I've never seen one depressed. I've never seen one frustrated. I've never seen him worry. I've never seen him mad. I've never seen him angry. I've never seen him down and out. I've never seen him offended. I've actually been at funerals that I have done where I've heard other family members overheard stuff they said about those people that obviously wasn't good. But you know what? They did not get offended. Right. Not one bit. And no, it wasn't anybody in my church. <laughs> Let's protect the church family. It wasn't a funeral I did for anybody in the church. Because <laughs> now everybody's thinking, let's see. who all <laughs> you're, you're bad. bad. I'm serious. If you could really get a hold of that phrase and live that. Because when you're, when you're getting offended, ladies and gentlemen, this is Satan lying to you, trying to get approval of other people. Live like a dead person. Right. I'm, you ought to look at somebody that's in, you ought to go find somebody that will intentionally try to offend you. And I mean, just tell them, have your best shot, man. Go for it. <laughs> and when they get done, just look at them and say, oh, I just love you. You can't offend me. I'm a dead man. <laughs> I'm dead. You're a nut. I'm dead. Can you say amen? What would you say? You said I'm a nut? I am for Jesus. I'm serious, man. Could you imagine if you live with the mentality? 
You have new life in Christ. But if you live with the mentality that you're a dead man, right. how in the world is Satan going to get under your skin? How's he going to get you mad at somebody? How's he going to get you to believe lies about you? That's right. How's he going to convince you about stuff about you, the accuser? How's he going to, accuse, how's he going to convince you of it if you're not listening? Right. Amen. You ever notice dead people don't hear you? That's right. You ever notice that? Yeah. I watch people talk to those people in the coffins all the time. They don't hear you. I'm not, I'm not belittling funeral. I'm trying to use a point. Why you keep listening to Satan? Live like a dead man. Right. Stop listening to his garbage. You can't offend me, Satan. You can't upset me. You can't get me mad. You can't get me worried. You can't get me fearful. I'm a dead man. I am now new in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. The old passed away. Uh, uh, my old spirit nature on the side, he passed away. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no, you know how many times I've told Satan this? And then he finally got tired of me whipping him with that sword. So then he came at me with something else. Amen. But I told him, I've been crucified with Christ. It ain't no longer I li who live, and you know it. That's right. Christ lives in me, and you know him too. Right. And the life I now live, I live by faith in him, what he did. Right. Now what I've done. Right. Good work. Can you say amen? This concludes another message from the ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. If you would like to find out more about us or contact Pastor Baker to have him as a guest speaker, just visit us on the web at cffchurch.com. That's cffchurch.com. You will also find many great resources that will help you further your walk with God. You can also contact our ministry by phone at 817-491-0624. That's 817-491-0624.